thank you for joining us for this time in the Word, and I uh, hope it will be an encouragement to you. Uh, we were looking all weekend at, or all week, and leading up into this weekend, uh, the forecast, and due to the timing of this storm in particular, um, as well as some of the forecasted totals of snow coming in, uh, they seem to be increasing, at least this is Saturday, and so they're increasing. Um, we were back and forth, but believe just looking around to other ministries and what they're doing and uh, looking at our own and dynamics for our church and our church family, I believed it was best just to make the call Saturday evening and um, hope that will be a help. Uh, we know many people are dealing with sickness right now too, so perhaps this will just be a timely way for our church family to just get some good rest, uh, spend some time together as a family. And um, as was mentioned in the email, if you are able and willing to help with some snow shoveling, um, probably later in the day on Sunday as the snow tapers off, uh, please contact Seth Ogden. We have a few folks who are in need of help. Um, if you need some help, please contact Seth as well. I'd love to get you on that and make sure we have help coming your way. Um, you also saw in the email, hopefully, uh, the mention of the men's prayer breakfast this Saturday. That will be up at our house at 8 a.m., and so would encourage our men to come and join us for this time. Josh Perez will be bringing a scripture challenge for us, and we're looking forward to that time um, in the word together and in prayer. It's always a blessed time together, good encouragement, and a rich, rich time of fellowship. I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles, if you have them, and turn to Luke chapter 11 for a few minutes. Um, I've also included in that email that was sent out and a link to a sermon that I found personally very encouraging and beneficial. Um, it was preached by a former pastor of mine, and uh, he preached it before the Christmas holidays, but looking to the new year and just looking at reading our Bibles better in the coming year, uh, we can all take encouragement and growth in this area. Um, I, I thought about preaching the message that was going to be for this Sunday, but I'd really like to be able to preach that in person and bring that to us as we gather together uh, at the church auditorium. And so looking forward to that next week. But uh, this challenge from Luke 11, I shared on Wednesday evening this past week to the folks who are here for prayer meeting. And I hope it will be an encouragement to you as well. Uh, maybe it will even be something that encourages you to come out and join us on Wednesday nights and uh, hear some more from this passage. But we are taking our time to look through Luke 11, verses 1 through 13. And we're going to take about two to three months to cover this on Wednesday evenings together, just taking little chunks at a time and giving thought to it, meditating on it. And then we go to prayer together. And we're just seeking to learn what it is to pray as a disciple of Jesus Christ. And so as we look at this passage even now, we'll see that is the whole context of Luke's record here. So let's look, Luke 11, beginning in verse 1, and let's read down through verse 13 together. And then we'll look a little more closely at this text. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us, and lead us not into temptation. And he said to them, Which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, Do not bother me, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, Will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? 
This passage, of course, is what is typically referred to as the Lord's Prayer. Uh, Perhaps you have memorized it or you have even grown up reciting it as part of a prayer um, in the day or in a church service or something similar in that nature. Matthew records a similar prayer in his well-known Sermon on the Mount, which Jesus preaches and is recorded in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. What Luke records here in this chapter seems to be a different occasion. There's a couple of reasons for that. The disciples here specifically ask Jesus to teach them how to pray. In Matthew chapter 5 and 6 and 7, Jesus is preaching, and in chapter 6, in the course of preaching, he tells them, here's how you should pray. And so it seems to be a different context, different occasion, different setting. That's not difficult or a challenge to us. Sometimes people will see different things Jesus said based on different gospel records, and they might wonder, oh, is it then, or did Jesus say that here, or was it then? Really, it's reasonable to think that Jesus preached a similar message wherever he went. Um, If I were to venture a guess, uh, my, my thought would be this, that Matthew 5, 6, and 7 really provide the main content of what Jesus preached as he traveled around through Judea and and Israel. And then, as he's in these different areas, he's taking portions or pieces or a version of that message, and he's preaching it in the towns and the places he's in. And so it would seem very likely that he's preached this, or he will preach it, and the disciples are asking Jesus, teach us to pray, and Jesus just simply brings in what he's already been teaching and preaching in other times. I'd like to give attention to these 13 verses, but specifically in this time, uh, just verse 1. But I want to begin by giving kind of a, a description and breakdown of the text here that we just read, and give a little bit of an idea of how to outline or lay this passage out. So let me just point out a couple things. In verse 1, we see the prerequisite to learning to pray. The prerequisite for learning to pray. There are certain things that must be true in order for us to learn to pray. The second section is in verses 2 through 4. And this is the section typically referred to as the Lord's Prayer. But I, I would actually encourage us to think a little differently about this. I was encouraged with someone else, uh, someone else's writing um, about this, and he made the comment that this is actually best thought of as the disciples' prayer. We think of it as the Lord's prayer, but this writer, and I think he had good reason for it, made the statement that actually the Lord's prayer would be better applied as a title to John 17, where Jesus prays that high priestly prayer. John 17 are the very words of Jesus spoken to the Father. This passage in Matthew 6 could better be referred to as the disciples' prayer, because these are words that Jesus intends to hand to his followers, his disciples, and use for their own prayer. So verses 2 through 4, we could say this, these verses provide the pattern for learning to pray. The pattern for learning to pray. And these words here are given as principles, as patterns, Uh, We can recite them as a prayer, but very often we probably should think in terms of them as categories, giving us some categories to think of and think in terms of for our prayer lives. And so we'll look at them that way in in, in coming days. Verses 5 through 13, the last portion of this section, give us two pictures. You have this picture of an impudent friend, this persistent friend who keeps knocking at the door. And then you have this picture of a loving father who gives his son what's needed and asked for. And Jesus uses both of these pictures to motivate his disciples to pray. And so we have here pictures for learning to pray. The pictures for learning to pray. And these these pictures do encourage and motivate us, move us to pray. And then the very last part that on Wednesday evenings together we'll look at as an outgrowth of this text is a little bit more of the practice of prayer. And in this section, in these times together, we'll be looking at a little more practically, how do we pray, some some real practical components, more of suggestions, um, but some really good thoughts on how we go about this. So we have the prerequisites for learning to pray, 
the pattern for learning to pray and the pictures for learning to pray. Now, I'd like to go ahead and look at verse 1, which says, Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. I'm going to give the prerequisite for learning to pray. And then we're going to expand on it by looking at this verse a little more closely. The prerequisite for learning to pray, if you would learn to pray, sounds and looks like this. We must be true disciples of Jesus. We must be true disciples of Jesus if we would learn to pray. Only true disciples ask what these men asked. Only true disciples desire what these men desired. In Jesus' day, disciples or learners, pupils, were a very common thing. This idea of discipleship, it's talked a lot about in Christianity and church circles today. But in Jesus' day, it was very much a cultural thing as well. Discipleship occurred when an individual would align himself or herself. Typically, uh, an individual would align himself with a teacher. And this could happen in the Greek context. And so you might have a philosopher that someone really latches onto. I really like the way they think about life and the philosophies they teach. And so they really fasten on that individual. Or this could be in the Jewish setting, a rabbi, a teacher, someone who's familiar with the word of God and the law. And so discipleship was someone aligning themselves or um, attaching themselves to a teacher. And in verse 1, we actually see this with John the Baptist. Uh, the disciples speak of John having his own disciples, and he would teach them. As John the Baptist was out doing his ministry, there were individuals following him, and they were attaching themselves to him. And this relationship typically consisted of at least a commitment to learn and apply the teachings of the master to one's life. But very often, it also had a very a more intimate connection where one would actually go and live with the teacher, walk with him, go where he goes. This is very much what we see with the 12 disciples and with Jesus, where they're spending all day long with him. And they're going with him to meals, and they're going with him from village to village. They're with him all the time without interruption. And this picture really comes into our own lives with this reality. A true disciple commits oneself to living as a learner the principles of a specific teacher. In this case, it'd be Jesus Christ. With that cultural piece in place, I want to notice three key marks in verse 1 of what a true disciple of Jesus Christ looks like. What makes a true disciple of Jesus Christ? The first, the first mark we'll notice is that a true disciple of Jesus is with Jesus even in private. Let me just look here. The scene opens in Luke 11, 1 with Jesus praying. That's not uncommon, especially in Luke's gospel. And as we might immediately picture Jesus off on some desolate mountain to pray, we, we, think in, we think in terms of privacy. If you were to walk into a room and someone's sitting there praying, you were to walk into the auditorium or into a classroom or somewhere, and someone's praying, you would probably immediately be quiet at least. You might even back out of the room because that's their privacy. Well, here the passage opens with Jesus praying, but what's implied by what follows after he's done is that the disciples are there with him. We're told that after he finishes praying, one of the disciples speaks to him. I would suggest the implication here is that his disciples are with him while he's praying. And that's not uncommon, unreasonable to think about. We have instances in the Gospels where Jesus has his disciples with him while he's praying. One of those examples would be the Garden of Gethsemane, the night he's betrayed. He took his disciples with him and he's praying in the Garden and his disciples are there with him. Peter, James, and John especially are close to him during that time. A true disciple of Jesus seeks to be as close to Jesus as much as possible. Or we could use these terms. 
crowding close to Christ. A true disciple of Jesus crowds close to Christ. And Jesus allows for that for each of us through the four-paned window of the gospel records in our New Testament. We don't have him living physically among us today, but he's given us the opportunity to press close to him, crowd close. So if we would learn to pray, we must be a disciple who crowds close to Jesus Christ. Let me ask you, are you crowding close to Christ as this new year begins? Are you looking to get as close to him as you possibly can, whether be that through reading the Gospels themselves or reading other portions of the Bible and seeing how it points to Jesus Christ, watching the epistles unfold Jesus Christ, reading Hebrews and seeing the better sacrifice, the better way in Christ, looking at Revelation and seeing the consummation of everything in and through Christ, wherever it might be, are you crowding close to Christ? Are you picking up books that encourage your heart and drive you to look at and see more of Christ? This is a mark of a true disciple. But what does a disciple who gets close to Christ do? What happens? What, what do we do as we get close? And that's the second mark to notice here. A true disciple of Jesus watches and listens to him. These disciples seem to be with Jesus. And when he finishes praying, they say, Lord, teach us to pray. By this point of Luke's gospel, the disciples have spent much time with Jesus, watching him work and listening to him teach. But we have enough information to know they'd also watched and listened to him pray. And I want to just take you through a quick journey in Luke, looking at a few passages to actually see this taking place. So I'm going to ask you to turn back in your Bibles to Luke chapter 5 for a minute. Luke chapter 5. In this chapter, we find Jesus calling his first disciples in the first 11 verses or so. Verses 1 through 11, Jesus calls his disciples. And I want to look at verses 15 through 16, though. After he calls the disciples, we read this. Now even more, the report about him went abroad, and great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities. But he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. Luke's grammar implies here a habit. Jesus was in the habit of withdrawing to desolate places to pray. Doubtless, the early disciples observed that habit. He's called his disciples, and certainly at times they would wonder, where did Jesus go? He's disappeared again. But let's keep going. Luke chapter 6, verses 12 and 13, we have a record of a night of private prayer by Jesus, which he spent before the major moment of calling his 12 disciples to be apostles. We don't have the record of the disciples' presence with Jesus at this time, but again, he seems to be in the habit of withdrawing to pray. And when he would do this, the disciples certainly would have noticed the third instance of Jesus praying is in Luke 9. At first, in verse 16, Jesus prays publicly to bless the food. There's three instances in this one chapter. Jesus prays to bless the food, first of all, in verse 16. The disciples see and hear that, and then they watch the miraculous feeding of over 5,000 people. Certainly, that caught their attention. But then... Second, in verse 18, we're told Jesus was praying alone, but then this is added, the disciples were with him. Perhaps something he prayed prompted Jesus to stop and ask them, who do the crowds say that I am? Well, third, in verses 25, 28 through 29, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up on a mountain to pray. And it's as he's praying that he's transfigured. So Luke 9 gives us three more examples of Jesus praying and his disciples are with him, watching, observing, and certainly learning and being encouraged in this way. Luke 10 offers two more glimpses. First, in verse 2, Jesus commands his disciples to pray. They've watched, they've listened, they've learned. 
And now he turns to them and he says, it's your turn. Pray that the Lord of the harvest would send out laborers. But then look down at verses 21 and 22 and we read this. In that same hour, he rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, or who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. And the disciples, again, appear to be with Jesus for this prayer as well, based on his interaction in the next two verses. And so now, in Luke 11, 1, the pupils turn to the teacher, and they say this, Teach us to pray. See, the first mark of being a true disciple of Jesus is that a disciple crowds close to his teacher. But as he crowds close, as she gets as close as possible, what's happening is they're desiring to watch and listen to what Jesus has to say. That's the second mark. These disciples are watching and listening to Jesus as they crowd close to him. And they end up, because of that, as they crowd close and as they watch and listen, the third mark happens. The third mark is this. True disciples of Jesus desire to be taught by him. These followers wanted to learn to pray. They desired Jesus' instruction, which led them to ask for it. In fact, their desire to learn to pray led them to pray. They had crowded very close to Christ, right into his private prayer closet, as it were. And think of the things, the glorious things they saw. Jesus transfigured, crowds of people fed. They'd watched and listened to his example and exhortation, and they wanted to do as he did. That's the heartbeat of a true disciple of Jesus. Now, persistent progress in the habit of prayer marks true disciples of Jesus Christ. Not perfection, but persistent progress in the habit of prayer marks true disciples of Jesus Christ. Do you want to learn to pray? A desire to learn better how to pray is a mark of a true disciple. And that really begins to happen as one crowds close to Jesus Christ to watch and listen to him. What does he say? What does he do? And as you see him, as you hear him, your heart should be stirred to this fact. I want to learn. You say, I don't really have that desire. I don't really see the importance of learning to pray. Can I encourage you? Then go back to step one. Go back to mark one, the first mark, and crowd close to Christ again. If you would learn to pray, being a true disciple of Jesus Christ is the prerequisite. And the marks of that discipleship are a crowding close to Christ. Secondly, to watch and listen to Christ. Thirdly, to desire to pray as Christ prayed. May God help us to learn to pray. Desire to learn to pray. And I hope that we'll be encouraged to crowd close to Jesus Christ in the coming days as well as the coming year. May God bless you. May you have a great rest of the day. And I trust that it will be a restful day in the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word, for the truth that it brings to our lives. Encourage us. Lord, stir us to draw close to Christ, to desire to learn to pray. Father, we thank you for your instruction and guidance to us. We pray for your safety and your goodness in our lives today and over the course of the next few days. We ask for your mercy and your grace each day that we'd walk closely with you. In Jesus' name, amen.